Good morning, everyone. Uh, happy Sunday to you. Um, as you uh, no doubt can tell by the video in front of you, things are uh, pretty different again for each of us. Um, by now, I'm sure all of you have received my letter and my email and uh, all of the news regarding us going back into a, a, a period of suspending some of our normal activities. This by no mean means uh, mean, means that the church is shut down. It is not. The church never shuts down. Uh, we are continuing to serve in this community. We continue to worship God, study the word of God, and uphold one another in fellowship and faith, despite any social distance that is between us. The church of God, uh, it, we are told in scripture, will not fall, even to the gates of hell. And so I can assure you, my friends, if you have any anxiety about this church's functioning, I will tell you that we are functioning as good as we can right now. Um, we are far from the only congregation in Seguin and Texas in the United States and in the world who currently faces these challenges in this way. It is our responsibility as people of faith to protect one another within our communities, whether that be within our congregation or within the world at large. Um, this is our Christian calling. Uh, Jesus, Jesus, the ministry of Jesus Christ was one that was concerned for people who are sick, for people who are vulnerable, for people who are alone, for people who suffer. And therefore we should be as well. And so in this time, let us join in solidarity with our brothers and sisters of this congregation and of our world, for whom gathering is not an option, especially now. I also want to uh, say a special thank you in particular to Christina and to Lindsay for being very flexible with your time and with your efforts. Uh, this is uh, a season in our lives in which flexibility is paramount. That goes for church staff. It also goes for church members. Uh, we need to remember that we're all doing the best we can with what we have, uh, that this is a developing situation that none of us really know how to handle uh, fully. And we all can think we have the answers all we want, but the truth is we don't. Uh, if an epidemiologist with three PhDs doesn't have the answer, I can assure you neither do I and neither do any of you. Uh, so. Let us be kind to one another. Let us realize we are all doing the best we can. Um, our worship service for today, uh, because uh, session met uh, Thursday evening to determine uh, a suspension of our normal activities, we uh, have had to kind of scrap our previous worship plans for uh, a typical time, type of Sunday. And so this is gonna be an abbreviated form of worship. In fact, there's just gonna be a sermon that I preach and uh, some prayers, and that's about it. Uh, however, next week we will be back to doing kind of what we were doing before, where we have a full service, we will send out a bulletin to you, we will have hymns, we will have all of uh, the pretty typical things that we do in worship uh, in video format for each of you. Um, I am working on trying to figure out ways of getting uh, a video uh, to folks who do not have internet access. Uh, bear with me on that one. That's a bit of a challenge, um, but we are working that out. Uh, as always, uh, I will continue to be here uh, in the church and in the community, uh, even though I will be social distancing as well. However, you have every uh, right and ability to call me. My personal cell phone number uh, is 512-285-0967. My, pers my personal email is pastorandy.seguin at gmail.com. I want to hear from y'all. I will be frequently emailing things out to you. I would like you to email things back to me. Keep me updated on your lives. Uh, not only for me to be in prayer, but for me to figure out ways in which we as a community can reach out and to help you as you are a member of the body of Christ. And that is our responsibility and our blessing as the people of God to be able to uphold one another in prayer and in help and in strength. Without further ado, 
our reading this morning comes to us from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. I will give you a moment, if you wish to follow along at home, to grab a Bible and uh, to, to uh, turn to that, of course. And again, this is Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Let us together listen for God's word. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as being better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own self-interests, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. But instead he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend and in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work within you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, with the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are eternal and our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Why? must we live in community? I'll repeat that again. Why must we live in community? If there is a question, which I am one day going to be exceptionally eager to present to God, I would certainly say that that one is it. In fact, uh, several months ago, uh, Sheila Moore's uh, granddaughter uh, was here for the potato luncheon, and this is the exact question she asked me. What would you ask God when you get to heaven? And I said, this is it. Why are we called to live in community? Why must we, as people of faith, be in community together? I understand and I grasp the concept of needing to be saved. I know from my own personal mistakes that I am indeed incapable of saving myself, of making right my mistakes and of fixing my deep faults and fears which continue to haunt me daily. And I am able to look around at a broken and a hurting world and I can make the guess that all of those people also seem to be in need of salvation, whether they want to admit it or not. In fact, sometimes I am more eager to want to point out their need for God more than my own. And once more, 
I fall into the trap of my own sinfulness. We all know that we are sinners. At least I, I hope we all know that. I can most assuredly tell you that if you are currently capable of having a heartbeat, then it is more than likely that you also do think and say things throughout your day that in some way threaten to damage the universe in your midst. We are all in deep, deep need of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom the God of the universe reveals to us his love for us and graciously gives to us freedom and salvation from our sin. I get all of that. It resonates deeply with me. It is not something that I only understand in an intellectual sense, but it is something which I feel deeply in the very bones of my being. But to accept that this is true is only to accept half of the meaning present in God's gracefulness. God also calls us as people of faith to be in community with one another, to bear with one another, to worship, pray, eat, love, and protect one another as a people of God. Why? Why is it not enough for me to simply be saved from my own sin? Why must I now live in community as well? Community is messy. It often requires that we put our trust in others. And as I already mentioned, all of those others out there seem to be just as messed up as I am. To be truly within a community, we have to allow ourselves to be vulnerable. And well, that's just something which for most of us is terribly uncomfortable. Communities are prone to argue. They are prone to disagree. At least most of the time, I have not found myself in a disagreement with myself, although I am quite sure it's happened on more than a few occasions. <laughs> but in a community, disagreement is an everyday thing. So I ask again, why would God dare to call us to live in community? In the first chapter of his letter to the community of faith in Philippi, the Apostle Paul encouraged this group of early Christians to remain strong and present to the responsibilities of faith in the midst of suffering even when that suffering leads them to wanting to just throw in the towel, that the presence of Christ is not just sitting on a throne in heaven, but is in their very midst. So we have to remember to read the passage this week as a continuation of a conversation which has already started a chapter earlier. We must also remember that while there are many who might quote or lift up a line from this passage as something that is only concerned with the personal dimension of faith, that the focus here is not, in fact, on the personal, but on the communal. And so it is through community that the individual weathers the storm. And it is in community that we live out our faith and our call to a Christ-centered life. There seems to be a great level of fear that plagues the Philippian church and distracts them from their mission as ambassadors of the kingdom of God. And today's passage focuses on what Paul sees as the remedy for this fear. And so what exactly is this community of God's people which we call the church? What do I mean? Well, the New Testament word, Greek word for church is ecclesia, and it literally means those called forward. The church is a body of people which have been called. Has any one of you ever gotten up on a Sunday morning and 
thought to yourself that you were being called by God to join with something bigger than just yourself? Have you ever really stopped and asked to yourself if you were truly here by your own free will and volition? Or is it possible, just possible, that you have been led by God to be a part of life in a particular community, in a particular time, and in a particular place? And that that life shapes you, forms you, and molds you into the image of God that you were created to be. Now, I think this is a powerful notion. And it's perhaps the most unique thing about the Christian faith among the other religions of the world. You see, we believe that God, the creator, sustainer, and savior of the entire universe, the infinite and the unfathomable God, that God calls each of us into deep, personal relationship with himself. And... And this is the part most people like to forget with one another as well. The grace of God not only brings us into relationship with God, but also transforms and renews our relationships with one another. And the crucible in which that change is set to take place the capsule with, in which our old selves are chipped away and transformed, the garden in which we grow and bear new fruit is the church. And in the church, we become a new people. We experience a new way to be human. We are supposed to be this way. That is the purpose of our being here. But we, are, but we all are well aware that across the entire world that there are plenty of congregations which serve not as oases of living water, but rather as stagnant, mosquito-filled cesspools. I have been in many a congregation in which the life that might have originally brought these people together has now long since faded places where worshipers go out of a sense of naked obligation rather than a call to being transformed. Or perhaps they look for an easy and non-transforming fellowship, a kind of country club mentality where one can form relationships, but these relationships do not deepen one's faith. These places have lost the glue that binds them together in fellowship and have become dry husks of what they could be like. Now, I have been witness to many. And they all tend to wonder to themselves why they don't grow. Why new faces don't seem to darken the door and have not darkened the door in decades. They've probably tried out a plethora of stewardship and growth campaigns. They've probably built new facilities and tried out new ministries. And I will tell you that all of these things are, in fact, fine. There's nothing wrong with trying to build new facilities and try new approaches to new things. But all of these things will fall to dust if we do not have the glue that sticks us together. And according to Paul, in this passage, that glue is compassion. Now many folks think of compassion as kindness, but in reality it runs way deeper than that. The word compassion when it is broken down into its parts, literally means to choose to suffer with somebody. Whereas kindness might compel us to smile and hand over a dollar to a homeless man, compassion will then motivate us to spend the day talking with him, 
walking with him and befriending him. Kindness is easy and it's transient. Compassion is difficult and it threatens to destroy our own sense of comfort and normalcy. To transform who we are to our very core. You see, we leave something of ourselves behind when we engage in compassion. And with each piece left behind, we slowly begin to change into the image of the Savior who claims us. It is seeing vulnerability in the eyes of another and choosing to respond by becoming vulnerable ourselves. The church of Jesus Christ throughout the world, throughout the United States, throughout Texas, throughout Seguin, and throughout our little community of love is facing a challenge, the likes of which none of us in our own lifetimes have faced, though many previously in other lifetimes have. There are people in our midst who are vulnerable. People of all ages, of all types, of all abilities, who if they get sick, will likely die. And the nature of this disease is as such that we can be shedding it and transmitting it to people long before we begin to show symptoms ourselves. Hence the social distancing. I'm not saying anything you haven't heard already. Whether you believe it or not, I cannot make you do that. But what I can say to you now as your pastor is this. You and I and all of us are required Wired by God to live compassionately. Not just kindly, but compassionately. If we know one in our midst is vulnerable, or suffers, or is afraid, then we are called as God's people to join that person not to ignore them, not to forget them, not to simply say, uh, yeah, we wish you well, but to alter our own lives in order to serve the needs of that individual. That is what it means to be Christ-like in our service. That is what it means to practice compassion. It is uncomfortable. It is threatening. It can even be damaging to our own sense of self. But one thing that it absolutely is, is that it is transforming. It is the means by which the Holy Spirit transforms you. And it is the means by which we, as a community of faith, transform ourselves. And we are all called to it. None of you are exempt from it. I am not exempt from it. No church is exempt from the call to live compassionately. And so that means sacrifice. It may mean a lot of sacrifice. But where there is great sacrifice, the power of the cross teaches us there is also greater love. God will not leave us. So we must not leave one another. And as we continue to sacrifice our sense of the normal, our sense of the right, our sense of the safe, trusting in God by the power of the Holy Spirit, we will learn to be the church even more. And in being the church, we will learn to love better.
wherever you are today, wherever you are watching this video, know that you are loved. Know that you are valued. Know that despite my faults and the faults of all the people who serve, know that you are not forgotten. Know that we think of you. Know that we love you. Know that we will sacrifice for you. But also know that you are called to sacrifice for others too. We are called to be the church, the people of God, the holy ambassadors of a new kingdom and a new way of being, a new way to be human. Go forth in the peace of God, in the power of Christ, and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.